it's a new radio telescope in British Columbia that we just turned on a few weeks ago. And uh, for this talk, I thought I would give you a virtual tour of the telescope, explain how it works, and describe some of the ambitious measurements it's about to undertake. Uh, so this is the night sky that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Richard just gave uh, a great talk uh, describing some of the amazing <coughs> things that you can see at visible wavelengths. But visible light occupies only a small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Although our eyes are limited to this tiny window, uh, we can build detectors that are sensitive to light in other parts of the spectrum. In fact, we can pull the entire range of wavelengths from gamma rays, high energy, to radio waves, low energy. Different astrophysical processes emit and absorb light at different wavelengths. So by sticking these detectors on telescopes, pointing them at the sky, we can obtain new insight into the universe. Chime is a radio telescope. Uh, it's sensitive to light with a wavelength between a quarter meter and three quarters of a meter, or equivalently a frequency between 400 and 800 megahertz. I've indicated the chime band here. Uh, you can see that it's sensitive to the same frequencies that are used to broadcast energy over the air. Uh, this is what the sky looks like at radio wavelengths. This is a full, uh, full sky image at 400 megahertz that was released in 1982. Uh, it's dominated by emission from our own galaxy called synchrotron emission. Uh, this originates from cosmic ray electrons that are moving at relativistic speeds, spiraling around interstellar magnetic fields. The arc in the upper central portion of the map is called the North Galactic Spur and is thought to be part of an expanding shell of an ancient supernova remnant a few hundred light years from the sun. You can also see radio emission from objects well beyond the Milky Way. Uh, this is a radio survey at 1.4 gigahertz called NVSS that was carried out in the mid-1990s. Each dot in this image is a radio source. There are about 1.8 million sources in total shown here, nearly all of which are extragalactic. Most of the sources are either radio galaxies and quasars, which uh, have their radio emission powered by supermassive black holes at their center, or star forming galaxies. Uh, here are a few examples of radio telescopes. There's a fundamental limit on the angular resolution that you can achieve with a camera or telescope called the diffraction limit. In a best case scenario, the angular resolution will be equal to the wavelength of the light divided by the diameter of the aperture or dish. Because radio waves have wavelengths that are a million times larger than that of visible light, in order to achieve a similar angular resolution as optical telescopes, radio telescopes have to be very big. Indeed, radio telescopes are the largest telescopes in the world. The top row of the slide shows two examples. The Green Bay Telescope is has the largest spherical dish at 100 meters. The Arecibo Observatory held the record for largest stationary dish at 305 meters meter diameter for about 50 years, until late 2016 when it was superseded by FAST, a 500 meter diameter telescope in southwest China. Alternatively, radio telescopes can consist of an array of small telescopes separated by large distances. If you are able to combine the signal recorded by these smaller telescopes in a proper way, you can achieve an angular resolution equivalent to the diffraction limit set by the largest distance between telescopes. This technique is called interferometry. In the bottom row, I have two examples of interferometers. The VLA, which is 27 telescopes, has a longest uh, separation of 16 kilometers. Uh, and ALMA, uh, sorry, 36 kilometers. And ALMA, which is an array of 54 telescopes, uh, whose largest separation is total of 16 kilometers. VLA focuses on uh, meter and centimeter wavelengths, and ALMA focuses on millimeter and submillimeter wavelengths. So this is a video taken by a drone flying over the CHIME telescope. Uh, it looks nothing like the telescopes on the previous slide. It has a unique design that combines aspects of the single dish and interferometric arrays. It consists of four large cylinders that resemble snowboarding half pipes. Each dish is 20 meters wide by 80 meters long. Traditional telescopes have a focal point where they focus the light. These cylindrical dishes have a focal line, which you can see running down the middle of each cylinder. Uh, the focal line of each cylinder is populated with 256 evenly spaced antennas. These antennas measure the radio waves falling across the surface of the dish 
and feed that signal to a correlator. The CHIME correlator is a sophisticated networking and signal processing instrument that performs interferometry on the signals by, recorded by the 1024 antenna. Uh, CHIME is the first major telescope to be built in Canada in over 30 years. The collaboration consists of four Canadian institutions, the University of British Columbia, the University of Toronto, McGill, and the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory, or VR, VRAO. CHIME is located at the DRAO, which is nestled in the Okanagan Valley uh, in British Columbia, near the city of Penticton. Uh, this is a picture of the observatory. You can see CHIME here. There's a smaller scale press bed for CHIME called the Pathfinder. Uh, the DRAO is also home to a 26 meter telescope and an interferometric array called the Synthesis Telescope, uh, which consists of seven missions. You can see one of them right here. Uh, a major concern for astronomy of, at radio wavelengths is man made radio interference, uh, or RFI. So, cell phones, Wi Fi, TV, AM radio, FM radio, radar, GPS, and many other forms of communication are transmitted at radio wavelengths. The mountains around the observatory uh, shield the site from the RFI from nearby cities. The valley is also a legally protected radio quiet zone. This means that you're not allowed to bring cell phones onto the site. If you want to use a computer on the site, you have to put in a radio type metal box. But there's only so much we can do, and a significant portion of our frequency band is still contaminated. Uh, so, this plot in the lower right corner shows power measured by the telescope as a function of radio frequency. And you can see, you clearly see a dramatic increase in the known TV bands. We also see uh, a large increase of power at higher frequencies due to LTE cell phone bands, which have been slowly growing with both amplitude and width over the past few years. I'll now describe how the telescope works. The telescope has no moving parts. Instead, it relies on the Earth's rotation to move the sky across its field of view. It just sits there, pointing at the patch of sky directly overhead and recording the radio waves incident on its surface. The red ellipse in this animation indicates the field of view of each chime antenna. The Earth's rotation moves the sky through this field of view. This means that chime observes a patch of sky at the equator for about 15 minutes each day, and a patch of sky at the North Pole continuously. Uh, the instrument is akin to a flatbed scanner that makes one scan of the entire northern sky every day. So why does China have this long, high cloud shaped field of view? From the east-west direction, the dish is a parabola that focuses light. This is illustrated in the diagram on the right. Uh, radio waves from an astronomical source overhead reflect off the parabola and converge at the focus. The geometry is such that all of these paths have the same length and the radio waves add coherently. On the other hand, radio waves coming from a source off axis uh, will not add incoherently. And this gives us a narrow one to two degree field of view. In the north south direction, the dish is just a flat reflector. So radio waves from sources anywhere in the sky within this narrow east west strip can bounce off the reflector and reach each antenna. This gives us a large 100 degree field of view in the north south direction. So now recall that the focal line of each cylinder is populated with 256 antennas. The signals from these antennas feed into a giant supercomputer called the correlator. The correlator can essentially mimic that parabolic dish and digitally add phase delays to the signal recorded by each antenna so that radio waves coming from a particular part of the sky add coherently. This can be repeated for many points on the sky. In total, we are able to phase up to 256 independent points along the meridian. This is the interferometry aspect of our experiment. Of course, we can also do the same thing in the east-west direction by combining the signals from antennas on different cylinders. The end result is an extremely large field of view sampled at about a quarter degree resolution. Uh, and the large collecting area translates to high sensitivity. So I'll now give you a tour of the instrument. The instrument is neatly divided into five subsystems listed in the diagram on the left-hand side. We'll start at the cylindrical dish. The actual surface of the cylinder is made of a galvanized steel mesh, not dissimilar to chicken wire. We were forced to use a mesh to prevent accumulation of snow on the dish in the winter, since we can't tip the dish over. For radio waves that have a meter long wavelength, the two centimeter mesh is still an excellent reflector. Uh, one lesson that we learned from the smaller scale pathfinder instrument is that the focal line, so this part right here, is an ideal home for birds. Uh, it's elevated and closed, making it safe from predators, and it's also quite warm because
because there are many amplifiers in here dissipating power. If you were to lift up one of the walkway plates covering the Pathfinder River <coughs> line in early summer, you might find this scene. These are baby starlings, uh, starlings who are our most frequent guests, and the mother lets them enter it along with the coaxial cables. Uh, a few of our, the people on the team have gotten very good at bird proofing uh, vocal lines, so hopefully we won't have this problem with China. Uh, so radio waves from the sky are measured by these custom designed clover leaf shaped antennas. Uh, these antennas were made from conventional printed circuit board or PCB, which enabled them to be mass produced at low cost. Each polarization of each antenna is fed to a low noise amplifier in the focal line, which boosts the sky signal. It then travels over 50 meters of coaxial cable from the focal line to a hut located underneath the cylinder. Inside each hut, we have a shielded room where we keep our electronics. The room attenuates the radiant interference produced by our electronics by order, over 10 orders of magnitude, essentially protecting the instrument from itself. Each coaxial cable feeds into a circuit consisting of a filter um, and amplifiers. The filter picks out the radio frequencies of interest defining our 400 to 800 megahertz band. The 2,000 or so filter amplifier blocks occupy an entire wall of the hub. Oh dear. Um, Next, the signal is passed to analog to digital converters or ADCs. The ADCs digitize the sky signal at a rate of 800 megahertz. They are located on daughter boards that attach to custom mother FPGA motherboards. Here you can see the motherboard in blue and the ADC daughter boards in red. FPGA stands for Field Pro Pro Programmable Gate Array. It's an integrated circuit consisting of logic gates and RAM blocks that can be programmed to carry out specific manipulations of data. In our case, we use the FPGAs to split the 400 megahertz wide bandwidth into 1,000 narrow frequency bands. We call this channelization, and each FPGA motherboard channelizes 16 analog inputs. After channelization, we are in a situation where we have all of the frequency bands for a single antenna in the same place in memory. But what we really need is a single frequency band for all of the antennas. So we have to do this massive reorganization of data. Uh, we, we want all of the antenna in a single place to do the interferometry. Um, to accomplish this, 16 motherboards are interconnected through custom backplanes that provide high speed 10 gigabit per second links between each motherboard and every other motherboard. In total, there are eight backplanes and 128 motherboards digitizing, channelizing, and reorganizing the data of over 2,000 analog inputs. The data rate at this stage of the processing is 6.6 .6 terabits per second, <coughs> which is comparable to all of North America's cell phone traffic. After reorganization, the data is transmitted over more than 1,000 fiber optic cables to a supercomputer that performs the interferometry. The supercomputer consists of 1,024 high-end GPUs spread out over 256 servers. It is housed in two shipping containers that are physically distinct from the receiver huts. This is a photo of the interior of one of these uh, shipping containers. The two images on the bottom are a rendering and a photo of a single server. Both the CPU and GPUs are cooled via direct-to-chip liquid cooling systems. The computational complexity scales as the number of analog inputs squared. So correlating the 2,048 analog inputs requires a huge amount of computing power. This was only made possible thanks to the existence of low-cost GPUs from AMD that were developed primarily for computer games. So we're using the AMD Pure X model. Uh, so it's impossible to save all of the data to disk. Even if we average our data over 10 second time scales, the raw data product still amounts to 135 terabytes per day. Real-time processing is required. So China will tackle three major questions in astrophysics and cosmology. Each of these three science topics has a dedicated backend that pipes off the data stream from the correlator and performs additional real-time processing. Each backend is working with data at very different time scales. Pulsars are rapidly rotating neutron stars that can be used as extraordinarily precise clocks. The Chime Pulsar backend will monitor all known pulsars in the northern sky, searching for the signature of a cosmic background of gravitational waves. Emmanuel uh, Pacento will give a talk tomorrow at 11 a.m. on pulsar timing arrays. The rest of my talk will discuss the cosmology and fast radio burst science. I'll describe the cosmology measurement in some detail and I'll conclude with a description of fast radio burst. 
So this slide overviews our current understanding of the history of the universe. Uh, the universe began 13.8 billion years ago from an initial state of extreme temperature and density called the Big Bang. It has been expanding and cooling ever since. For the first few hundred thousand years, uh, the universe was a hot soup of radiation, electrons, protons, and dark matter. Radiation was constantly scattering off the electrons and the universe was opaque. Eventually, the universe cooled to the point where the electrons and pro protons could recombine to form neutral hydrogen. When this happened, the radiation decoupled from atomic matter and was able to stream freely through the universe. We can observe this primordial radiation uh, today at microwave frequencies. Uh, the cosmic microwave background, which is shown here, gives us a glimpse of the universe as it uh, was when it was very young, just 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Uh, there was a period after recombination when the universe was dark. During this time, the neutral hydrogen gravitationally collapsed into the potential wells created by dark matter. Eventually, uh, the first stars and galaxies formed. The light from these stars reionized the intergalactic medium, and the heavy elements forged in the interior of these stars form the basis of light today. Uh, galaxies then collapsed into clusters of galaxies, and these clusters merged into superclusters. During this time, the expansion of the universe slowed as matter felt the constant tug of gravity. Then about four billion years ago, the expansion of the universe began to accelerate. We call the agent responsible for this accelerating expansion dark energy. Because of dark energy, galaxy clusters are moving away from each other at an increasingly rapid rate. Uh, today, dark energy accounts for 70% of the total energy density of the universe. Uh, we have a wealth of measurements of the nearby universe, so around here. And also, we have exquisite measurements of the cosmic microwave backgrounds right here. But the area in between is more difficult to probe. Uh, Chime will map out a decent chunk of the universe when it was 3 to 8 billion years old. This is right before the transition from decelerated to accelerated expansion. By measuring the expansion of the universe during this time, we can probe the fundamental nature of dark energy. Uh, so I'm a bit short on time, so I'll skip the next few slides, but if people are interested in uh, exactly how the cosmological measurements are made, you can return uh, to this portion of the question. Uh, so Chime will map out the large-scale structure of the universe using a technique called hydrogen intensity mapping. Uh, this technique is promising, but it has not yet been demonstrated by any instrument. The proton and electron have a quantum property called spin. Um, and in, a, in the hydrogen atom, the spins of the proton and electron can either be aligned or anti-aligned. The anti-aligned state has a slightly lower energy, so given enough time, the aligned state will transition to the anti-aligned state. Uh, to conserve energy during that transition, it will emit radiation uh, in the form of a, a radio wave at 21 centimeters. Uh, this corresponds to 1,420 megahertz in the hydrogen rust frame. Uh, if the hydrogen atom is located at cosmological distances, the radiation will be redshifted to lower frequencies as it travels across the expanding universe to our telescope. Uh, in this way, the radio frequency of our observation <coughs> maps to a shell of hydrogen at a particular cosmological distance. Chime will make a low resolution map of the sky at radio wavelengths. Here we have a 3D map of the local universe from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey smoothed to Chime resolution. In any given pixel of the map, Chime will measure the aggregate 21 centimeter emission from the neutral hydrogen in many galaxies. Chime's wide bandwidth and large field of view then allows us to map out a huge three dimensional volume. Uh, this, this plot shows the expected cosmological constraints from Chime. The, the top panel indicates the distance to a particular redshift extracted from the large scale distribution of neutral hydrogen. So, black are previous measurements by optical galaxy surveys. Uh, Blue is for the Chime Pathfinder two-year survey, and red is uh, full Chime uh, five-year survey. And you can see that it nicely fills in this window, not yet called this window in redshift, not yet covered by the optical galaxy surveys. Um, and this just shows the, the measurements divided by the best fit cosmological model. You can see that we'll achieve sub percent or percent level precision. Um, during this time, directly before the transition from decelerated to accelerated expansion of the universe, which is indicated by the curving line. 
the last, last slide, time will also greatly improve our understanding of fast radio bursts. Uh, or FRBs. These mysterious events are bright bursts of radio emission that last less than a second. The first FRB was detected in 2007 and is shown in this upper right box. Um, you can see that the arrival time of the burst, shown here, has a strong dependence on radio frequency. <coughs> uh, the slope of this line is known as the dispersion measure and it's proportional to the integrated column electron density between the observer and the radio, uh, the, the source of the burst. The large dispersion measure found in FRBs indicate that they pass through an extremely large column of free electrons, greater than what we think exists in the Milky Way galaxy, implying that they might be located at cosmological distances and must be extremely bright. Only 24 FRBs have been detected since this initial burst. However, this implies that there are, there are on order 3,000 FRBs per day. This movie illustrates the random appearance of FRBs on the sky. The small number of detections to date is due to the simple fact that the sky is big and the events last less than a second. So you have to be serendipitously looking at the right place at the right time. Chime's large field of view means that it's observing a decent chunk of the sky at any given time. As a result, we expect to detect on order 10 FRBs per day. This will allow us to begin to study the properties of the FRB population and bring us closer to figuring out exactly what they are. Uh, and then I'll just conclude by saying, uh, showing some photos of people building the instrument. Uh, uh, students played a significant role in the, the design, testing, and assembly of CHIME. Uh, the telescope is now operational and plans to start collecting data in the next few months. If you'd like to learn more, uh, please check out our website. Thank you.